You might think that that hole was caused by shotgun blast from Prohibition days or that this was the original Bonnie and Clyde car or maybe the forerunner for the Lozier automobile. None of the above are true. This vehicle is so old you have to walk all around it and look underneath it even to find the motor. <laughs> Actually, I expected they would have brought some of the exhaust with them, but they didn't find the horses today. <laughs> We're on uh, the former Plattsburgh Air Force Base Oval toward the end of June 2002 for yet another wonderful Adirondack region. Antique car show, craft shelf, sale, flea market, who knows what all we're going to be seeing before we're through today. The weatherman has threatened rain. I wish he wouldn't do that. He was talking about uh, severe thunderstorm activity hovering around the area, possibly coming in late this afternoon. But as we're recording this on a Sunday morning at about 935, the weather is just fine. Uh, nice and warm, just a little bit muggy and uh, decent weather. We've been here for literally hundreds of functions down through the years and we're here again today for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is to talk about the Lozier automobile and when it premiered here in Clinton County, raced in the Indy 500 to talk with Tony Vaccaro and John Ionelli and Ron Venn and others on the committee to start a transportation museum here in the Plattsburgh area to include the, the uh, newly reconstructed, rehabilitated Lozier automobile, which is here under the tent, but many other items that have to do with transportation in the North Country. Dr. Tony Vaccaro is a man of vision and tremendous passion and energy, and has worked very, very hard to get this program started in the area, as you'll see, before we finish our little television tour on Hometown Cable and our little corner today. This will be the most, one of the most sought after tents, I'm sure. I've talked to dozens of people in preparation for recording this television show today and they all want to come and see the Lozier. For those of you who are regular viewers of Hometown Cable and our little corner, you know that we were here last year, right about the same time. And we waited, and we waited. And I left, and <laughs> Calvin stuck around, and all of a sudden, sudden the trailer with the old Lozier came in. It wasn't completely finished, and it still isn't. Um, these cars were painstakingly built by hand in the early part of the 20th century here in Plattsburgh and then elsewhere, as many of our viewers might know. Some people might be hearing about the Lozier for the very first time today, and that's great, because we'll try to give you a liberal education. They were built by hand then, and they're rebuilt by hand now. And the gentleman from Ontario is doing the work, and when you see a picture of it real close later in this television show, you will say, wow. The first thing I did when I walked in here today and took a look at it, and Calvin walked up, I said, you know what? That looks just like the model that Ron Venn made. <laughs> As if they were following the model to rebuild a car. Ron Venn has made uh, probably four reproductions of the Lozier automobile. The two regular Lozier's and now a couple of racing versions like the ones that raced in the Indy 500. He's a member of this committee. He's the official photographer and you know how Ron is with photographs. He's absolutely amazing. The gentleman who brought the Lozier here today also brought a Baker Electric. And if you have never seen an electric car from the very early 1900s, you should know that the Bakers, even the electric cars, even uh, were around before the, the internal combustion gas engines. And the electric car was a thing to behold. This car pulled up behind me when I got onto the grounds this morning and you couldn't even hear it coming. The giant batteries are just coming along. We'll try to take a look at that. There are cars of almost every type and era expected here today. We're actually beginning our show about uh, 20 minutes or 25 minutes before the actual affair is set to open up today. We're hoping that a lot of people are not dismayed by the weather. We live in the great north country. We see all kinds of weather in the course of a year. So if people bring a little umbrella, they should be okay. Even if they don't, there are a few tents to get under and that should be a wonderful time. 
So spend the next hour and a half or so with us as we tour the uh, Adirondack area antique car show, craft share, uh, craft fair, and flea market on the former Plattsburgh Air Force Base Oval. I know you're going to enjoy it. Another beautiful vehicle as part of the Tony Vaccaro collection. This is a 1910 National. And here's a guy that doesn't date back quite to 1910. Todd, how are you, buddy? Very good, Gordy. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Normally, we see Todd in a, in a very different setting at CVPH Medical Center, but uh, this is a kind of a passion of yours, too, isn't that, it, Todd? That's right. Uh, we all have our little vices, and this is everybody, everybody has a weakness, and this is mine. Um, I have a, a little yellow car sitting over in the parking lot. That's my toy. But I uh, happen to be associated with the uh, Champlain Valley Transportation Museum. And uh, we're starting to get, trying to get one going in the community. And these are all pieces that are going to be part of the museum. You're, you're the vice president, speaking of vices. I, that's right, I'm vice president. <laughs> Dr. Vaccaro is the president. And we have a group of local citizens that are getting together trying to form this. And we're hoping that it will wind up at Park and that it's all, all the community uh, the Historical Society, BOPA, everybody's going to get together and uh, try and share resources and bring something here. This is a part of a larger picture, something that our hometown cable listeners have heard Galvin and I promote for a long time, and that is area history and the appreciation thereof. This transportation museum will be a beautiful piece of that picture, won't it? Absolutely. We've got uh, numerous we uh, numerous tables full of Lozier memorabilia, and, and it's just absolutely astounding how they could take a car right off the road, put it in the Indianapolis 500, and have it win. Uh, it was just dramatic uh, to think that we had something that quality built right here. And you're right, it needs to be preserved. And also we're going to be able to provide something if you got grandma or grandpa's car out in the back and you just don't want to sell it and you'd really like to see it. Something like the Shelburne Museum. And be able to say donate it to the museum and be able to have it live forever. That's I'm real excited about that because I've seen things just go to, go to waste, be sold and leave the community. And this will be an opportunity to allow people to have a life Legacy. So that, that that should be pretty neat. Have you always had an interest in uh, antique cars? Uh, unfortunately, yes. My wife would say, <laughs> big boys, big toys. Yeah. So yes, I've got a 77 Corvette, and most of the people in the group have toys. Tony has a whole dealership full of cars. He certainly does. <laughs> and, and, and it's great. It's great. And uh, it's fun, and it allows us, all the gearheads, to get out and get together and, and look at beautiful, beautiful cars. and. Uh, actually get them to work and it's quite a pleasure. It takes uh, quite a while to get an area like uh, Plattsburgh and Clinton County to be enthusiastic about something like this transportation museum. But once you get them on the bandwagon then it'll start to roll. It's, it's not been without some strife in trying to get this thing organized. Oh it's absolutely. I, I just talked with Owen Barkham who has uh, an extensive collection of memorabilia. He said he started this back in the 70s yes. and was unsuccessful. And really, we've got the mayor finally uh, on board, and he has been a tremendous supporter of this. And it was it's really nice. And I think the other thing is the cooperation amongst the groups in town uh, are finally starting to say there's a real value to this. And uh, we've got some buildings out here. We can help maintain those buildings and bring people in. And as we start to have the uh, Ethan Allen come over and dock, they need a place to go. And well, we're hopefully uh, be able to provide that. Speaking about the mayor, I was glad to see former mayor John Ionelli here. John's a very oh. much a part of your group, and he's been interested in old cars for a long time. Well, that's true. And then we've also starting to bring people with the railroads and the mines. And the people at BOPA had talked about a troop train. And, you wow. know, it's all different kinds of transportation. Uh, some of the Lozier memorabilia talks about boats and engines and a trolley. And there's lots of things. It isn't just cars. So we've got just a, a tremendous wealth of things here. And it's going to be nice if we could sort of get it all in one spot. 
and uh, we were approached uh, a couple of weeks ago at a car show by a group from the county fairgrounds that has a whole bunch of agriculture items, tractors and the like, and they would be very interested in talking with us. And so we would be nice, we wouldn't have to travel all over the county, we could have it in one spot, because that's a whole part of our heritage too that we need to make sure we, we don't forget. This is quite a dream you guys have. Oh, and I know, I know. And I know you and I know Tony <laughs> and John and the rest of the group, I, I think you'll stick with it and hopefully oh. something big will really happen. Well, we hope so. And, uh, you know, hopefully somebody listening to this tape uh, will be able to say, you know, I wouldn't mind being part of that or I have a donation or I'd just like to come down and work. Once we get uh, the museum open, we're gonna need people to do guided tours uh, we're also going to have a hands-on portion for the kids. You know, let's face it, it's pretty hard to keep kids calm and cool and collected. So we're going to have a hands-on thing. We've got a fire truck and we're hoping to be able to get some boots and jackets and helmets and let them put that on and get their pictures taken. I see a lot of old fire trucks in fields around the North Country. I wish we could get a few of those down there. Ah, uh, that's right. That's right. Uh, the firemen are a huge part of the North Country. Uh, they were there in the ice storm and they're there in 9-11 and they're always there. And we need to recognize them. And that's, again, what we're trying to do. Little by little, we don't want to forget anybody. You know, I didn't know much about the National until we came here today, and I just uh, reading the, the plaque on the outside of this one, 1910 National Race Car, to uh, what, what we find astounding and interesting is the fact that this vehicle in 1910 had 491 cubic inches and developed only 50 horsepower. <laughs> that's right, that's right. It makes, <laughs> makes lots of noise and consumes lots of gas. Two spark uh, plugs uh, per cylinder. That's Isn't right. Isn't that cool? That's right. In yeah. Indianapolis for racing, I see the Lozier logo, although I don't think the two were in any way connected. Were they or no, were they? No, yeah. not, not to my understanding. Uh, what happens is this started out originally as a Lozier Museum and has quickly grown to our, our Champlain Valley. So uh, that was the original logo that we, we had started. <laughs> well, you know, our ideas get more global as they... As they go on, we were originally planning to have an interpretive museum for memories and history of the War of 1812 and the Battle of Plattsburgh, and now, hopefully, this could turn out to be a military museum, interpretive museum for all the wars, because this very sacred and hallowed ground that we're standing on, the former Plattsburgh Air Force Base Oval, has been a part of North Country history for over well over 300 years. So. Absolutely, uh, and if we can just have something that we can begin to start to preserve all the treasures that we have, uh, that would just be great. And it also uh, provides uh, something for the school children and, and also for the people to be involved. As we start to see more and more people come to the base and make this their residence, this will give them something to do, is to be part of our community. So uh, we'll, a good orientation to all the new people that will come to the North Country. What amazing changes over the last, even the last 10 years, not to mention the last 40 some years since I've been here. What, when did you come to town? I've been here for almost seven years. Have you really? And I came just as the base closed. I hope there was no connection oh, there. Oh, I do uh, too. Uh, so I, that's when I started. So it, it's really nice to see that we're starting to sell houses here and we're going to have some building. We're going to bring people in that have not had a chance to experience the, the area. And with the uh, fishing tournament that just got done, uh, we have a whole new group of people that had a chance to experience the beauty of our area. So. I sure hope it all works. And they're calling it the best smallmouth fishery in the United States, and that's not a bad thing to go and no, tell the no, world no, about, No, 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 to it? say that maybe uh, we're the best place around. We know it, and it'll be nice for other people to hear it. It's, but not, it's time to spread the word, I think. That's right. Let them come and visit and, and see all the nice things that we have. Thanks, Todd. You're welcome. Have a great day, my friend. You too. And uh, don't buy too many. <laughs> don't worry about that. <laughs> Oh, yeah, look at this beautiful car, huh? This is what a lot of us came here to see. We thank uh, Todd Crampett for talking with us and getting our program started today. We hope to interview a number of people before we're finished. We don't think it's really going to rain. I don't think we need any rain today. I think it's going to be a lovely day in the former Plattsburgh Air Force Base. This is it right here. See what that says? L-O-Z-I-E-R. Here's a guy who learned how to spell that when he was pretty young. Yeah, pretty young. Oh, right. and I forgot your last name already. Barkham. Barkham. Right. Uh, but you don't live in Shazy anymore. No, I'm down in Safety Harbor, Florida now. You have to come up and see us every now and right. again, don't you? Oh, yes. Now, you've developed an interest in the Lozier 
Uh, um, how long? How many years? 70s? In the 70s, early 70s, late 60s, early 70s, I started collecting pictures and it grows, you know. But, I mean, this turned out to be a real passion for you. Why the Lozier? Just because it was well, here? Well, it was built here in Plattsburgh. So why not pick something that's your home area, you know? Your home built right here in the Georgia Pacific building. Now, we're starting to talk about this wonderful transportation museum. It seems to me way back when you had an idea for getting a Lozier museum. Well, I, I talked to a few people back in the late 60s, and they didn't think there was enough interest in the county at the time. But that didn't damper my spirits. I just kept on collecting, you know. You know, people collect matchbook covers oh, yes. and beer cans and yeah. why not Lozier memorabilia? How many different pieces of stuff have you hooked onto over the years? Boxes and boxes. Thousands and thousands, thousands, thousands of things. Yeah. And always looking for more, you know. Always looking always for looking more. Always looking for more. And then you hooked up with Tony Vaccaro. Yeah, a couple of years ago and then it just grows and grows, you know. Do you correspond with him quite often even uh, though you're oh, way yeah. down in Florida? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Have you found any more Lozier? partial, any Lozier's or partial Lozier's? Well, every way? once in a while you'll find one in Hemmings or you'll find it in different magazines. But, you know, they're an expensive buggy, you know. Well, we got to get a slush fund of seven or eight million dollars here so we can <laughs> latch on to four or five of those. And, right. And we can have a race around the Oval. <laughs> well, there's not all that many left. There's probably less than 30 left in the whole country. Yeah. I figure anyhow. I mean. Well, this one... As, as many of our viewers uh, already know, if they've watched this program before, it was not actually built in Plattsburgh, but probably some of the parts were. Huh? Probably. This is a uh, Detroit car. But nevertheless, the, um, you know, basically drawings and everything came up from Plattsburgh area. So when it, you, it deserves a home here in Plattsburgh. Well, of course it does. And, you know, the interesting part, or there's so everything's interesting about the Lozier, such a a unique and special automobile because of the way it was made, how much it cost when it was brand new, but the fact that the building that it was built in still exists. Still exists. Um, actually, that's how I got started. I was working at Georgia Pacific back in 64, 65, and one night, one old guy there was ready to retire, told me that he remembers cars being built in here, coming in with his, <laughs> with his father when he's five, six, seven years old. Yeah. And they were working on cars, and then that sparked an, an interest that's never stopped, you know. It's amazing how things like this get into right. your blood. That's for sure. And that's you you sure. would travel almost to the ends of the earth to, to, uh, to collect information, oh, yeah. meet people. As far as I know, there's two of these in Florida. Really? Uh, really. And, you know, who knows? There may be others around, but... Have you, have you contacted either oh, one yes. of those people? Oh, yes. Oh, you have? On my way back, I'm going to stop in and see one of the guys. Are you really? Yeah. In Jacksonville, he has a lozier there. Always keep your uh, camera oh, yes. ready to go. On the front seat. You know, it's amazing to me that in spite of the fact that this car has been made for almost 100 years, that there are so many things left. Books, radiator caps, well, steering really wheels. Shifting levers, brake you, pedals. You name it, and it's there, you know. And it's, you know, it's. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if some people have Lozier parts in their garages or basements, wouldn't and we haven't bit. ferreted them out. Wouldn't I mean, surprise me a bit. Part of the fun of getting a, a transportation museum like this started is the fact that uh, you discover things. Oh, Every yeah. time Calvin and I do a show, people respond to it. We'll ask, mm -hmm. you know. Put us together, we got an IQ of about, uh, well, never mind that. But we, we're very good at asking questions. <laughs> and we, We're like the uh, 491 cube <laughs> engine yeah. over there. <laughs> that develops only 50 horsepower, I know. <laughs> but anyway, we hold our own. See this belly? We hold our own. No, we ask a lot of questions. And fortunately, we do have a lot of bright people who watch our program and who read my column in the newspaper who have answers. And half the fun is uh, to exercise that old philosophy of mine, touch and back away. Just broach the subject and then see what people do to respond. And each yeah. time we do a show here, last year when we did this show on the old base oval, people responded. And in the last uh, month or so, I've had some people who called me with tremendous connections 
with uh, Lozier Automobile, the Indy 500, and other things. So hopefully we'll get them and Tony and the committee together, and we'll, mm -hmm. by next year, maybe we'll really have something to crow about, huh? Well, that's for sure. So you've really enjoyed this whole oh, prospect. Yes. How, how much time, I know you do a lot of other things, traveling around and so on, but how much time do you really think you spend on this hobby in the course of a week or a year well, or a day? Or in the course of a year, quite a little bit. You know, you search the internet and you find stuff that way, you search magazines. You know, you never know what somebody might have and you follow every lead. You know, you can't turn anything down because it might be a good lead. Well, it's hard for people to believe like you and me that everybody doesn't look at, at eBay and, and open the internet every day to see what's available. But there are lots of people who don't have or want computers. I just read in the paper and saw in the news last night that Ann Landers, the world's most famous columnist, died at the age of 83. Till the day she died, she wrote her computer on some old royal typewriter because she hated computers. And when I, I read every column and she'd throw in an email address every once in a while for a company, and I knew that she didn't put that in there because right. she hated computers. But the point I'm making is that there are people possibly viewing this program today and many others in the country who have a little piece of a Lozier or a little piece right. of Lozier history lurking somewhere in the attic or basement oh, or garage sure. and these are the people we'd love to have come forward right we'll yeah. even put them on the committee if they oh want yeah them. i i know there's there's people in clinton county that would have you know some partial stuff of i mean their, their parents their father or grandfather somebody worked at Lozier, you know back in the early uh you know 1900s yeah either in the boats or in the uh in the car. Yeah, that's a facet of it that we haven't talked about a great deal, but uh, boats were part of transportation, so if we can get an old Lozier boat and motor as part of the museum, that'd be okay too, wouldn't oh, it? Oh, that very much. Very they, much. Were, they were pretty neat boats. Oh, yes. They? Very nice. Beautiful, beautiful engines. Now, have you been interested in other kinds of antique cars, or have you focused oh, yeah. only no, on No, I haven't only focused on Lozier. But yeah, I had a 36 Pontiac Coupe for years. And, you know, I gave that to my son, so he's playing with it now. But as far as, I always did like cars, you know, antique cars. You know, go to shows and see things and so on and so forth. But my real passion basically is 1920 and down. You know, the, the brass cars like this national over here. I mean, you know. Oh, isn't that? It's so beautiful. You know, who can look at that and not like it? Oh, you know? my goodness. But, you know, the funny part of it is I talk to, I live in a world of young people. The older I get the more I live in a world of young people. And these young people say, yeah, I got this old car, I got this old antique car. I say, what is it? They say 1983, whatever, you know, right. 1972, 19. I could never afford a new car even when I was 16 years old. So the first guy I ever bought was an antique, 39 Ford Standard Coupe. You know, some of these cars, and I appreciate the people that take care of them and whatnot, but they're like, yes, these parking lot cars <laughs> compared to these, you know? Yeah. These are very, very special, and we hope before we finish today, we'll educate some of the North Country about more of the history of the, the Lozier Works here in Plattsburgh, what happened after they left here, and the legacy. Oh, yeah. And this is part of the legacy that you see before us here today, and hopefully that museum, I don't know when it might open up, maybe next Tuesday if somebody will write us a big check, right? That's for sure. Yeah, it takes money. It doesn't just take a bunch of people working hard. It takes money to get a museum oh, yes. like this open. It does, but it's going to be worth it. Yeah, you have to have the support of the community, and that's a big thing. You have to have uh, governmental support because it's nice if you can get people to back you at, at all mm -hmm. levels. And if we do open a Lozier Museum, it'll be the only one of its kind in the in the country. And if we add other other modes of transportation like that old buggy out of somebody's barn <laughs> that showed up oh, here I'm sure that'll be even better there's a few of those around yeah you know i know where there are a few old hearses and mm -hmm. old bicycles and lots of stuff so this could be this could be kind of neat right i don't know i guess you're like i am i love to when i go to a town i love to see their museums i love to go and visit mm -hmm. their museum see what they've got right very much so up in um Clayton, New York, on the Thousand Islands, right. there is a wonderful and very old now uh, boat museum. Boat museum is up there. And I don't know if they got a I Lozier think there's, boat. I don't know if there's a Lozier boat there, but there's a Lozier engine there. There is a Lozier That was engine. in a boat, yeah. Or it was there, let's put it that way. 
I went to an antique car museum in Sandwich, the oldest incorporated municipality on Cape Cod, in 1976, during our great nation's bicentennial year. Mm -hmm. And I was interested in the Lozier back then, just as you were and are now. And I walked in, I really didn't expect to see a Lozier automobile. But I went, walked into the lobby, and I, they had a cabinet wall display of memorabilia from various kinds of vehicles in the past. And they had one thing, like a Lozier radiator cap mm -hmm. stuck in there and I was so excited you didn't have to show me another car all day <laughs> right so you know there's the point is they're all they're out there we need just get people interested and contact you contact Tony contact John Ionelli or other members of this committee and right. let's get this transportation museum underway that's for sure Owen Barkham thanks for making Thank the big you. long trip up here you see, he said you're going to do all the talking, right, Gordy? Right, yeah, that's, that's right. what. Sure. He did most of the talking. Okay. Thanks a lot, buddy. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Well, it's about uh, six minutes after 10 in the morning of this great antique Adirondack Antique Car Show Craft Shale Sale. I keep saying shale on the former Plattsburgh Air Force Base. And the people are coming in, the cars are coming in, but you know where we started, right? Right in here between the National and the Lozier with a guy who has uh, poured a little bit of passion and energy into this project, Dr. Tony Vaccaro. How are you doing, Tony? Good, very good. And I must say, I'm still married. It's amazing. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I'm watching I the clock. I'm watching the she's clock. Not, she's not here today. <laughs> the last time we saw your fantastic Lozier, it wasn't quite like this. Remember, it came here a little late last year. It showed up late. Uh, there was a late delivery last year. It didn't get here till about midday. And all we had last year was the shell of the car and the top. We didn't have the motor in it. We didn't have the interior work done. We didn't have the nickel plating done. Uh, it, it's come a long way. Um, Don Parsons up in uh, Ontario has been working on the leather. It's, he's been struggling for about six, seven months. Um, he's a gentleman who can, we, the reason we picked him was he's a gentleman who's old enough that can actually claim he remembers seeing them when they were new. So, uh, but he works because of that. He's, uh, he has to take his time when he's working on the car. His, his arthritis is uh, creeping up on him. So he worked a little bit every day on the car and we just about have the interior done now. We have a little bit of piping yet to do around the edges and one of the side panels need to be done yet. Um, but there's uh, uh, quite a lot of hours in there and it's come out just spectacular and I even haven't had a chance to look but when Eric brought the car down here today, we're going to look at this together because I honestly haven't seen this. Apparently Don found this. I'm not sure what we're going to see here. Don found this in underneath the old leather of the car. You gotta be. It kidding. was shoved down under. I've been told what it is, and let's oh. look at it. I Wait a minute. Look at the Baker Electric. Yeah. Is this incredible? This Eric Edwards and his yeah. wife Linda, uh, who brought the Lozier down for me See this the morning. On the sides, Calvin. Isn't that so cool? You can't even hear it coming. Oh. There's. Uh, I don't know if uh, anybody told you. There's one other car exactly like that in the country. Uh, there's only two of them in North America. The other one's owned by Jay Leno. And Eric, oh, and Eric, and we're not likely to get a hold of that. Real well, soon. I actually should talk to Eric because he actually was invited by Jay two months ago out to the show, and he got a private he got a private entrance into the show, him and his friend, and then afterwards they went to Jay's uh, three hangar, four hangar garages. He apparently has these air oh, yeah. these hangars on the he airport does. out there, and they're full of cars. Oh, sure. And Eric spent about four hours there with Jay going drooling. over drooling. Yes, but they talked about cars, and, and Eric said he couldn't have been a nicer gentleman about it all. He was very, very uh, That's fun great. to spend time with. But look at you can't hear a sound. It just kind of goes away. Isn't it just great? goes away. Let's I got to hold this Go up ahead, so take Calvin a look. can get a good view of it. I'm going to change hands with the microphone. Anyways, though, what, apparently when Don took the uh, leather work apart, this was pushed down underneath one of the pieces of leather. And it's dated, I haven't seen it yet, but I've been told it's dated, it's dated 1923. 
Lewis Wallace of Middletown, Orange County, New York. I know very well. I was born in Pearl River, right nearby in Rockland County. Um, and this is um, what this is one of the I guess the original. Manufacturers year 1916. Yeah. Now we have it listed as a 1915 because that's when we understood that Lozier 82s were built, on according to our records. We'll this, have to go back. This slid down between the seats that was between the seats apparently don pulled this out he this it was in this little you envelope. haven't seen it but no this is the first time i've seen it they just they gave it to me as a gift this morning they've been holding on to it and they said we wanted to surprise you with this remember uh, headlights must comply with the law oh well <laughs> it does have headlights on it that was a pretty pretty nice uh registration yeah New one, uh-oh, do not detach or application will not be accepted. Keep this certificate. New ones cost a dollar. Do you, what, do you think, what do you think DMV is going to say when I show this to them? Do you think they'll be able to use this or oh, figure this one out? That is amazing. <laughs> so it's fun of, the fun of the, getting involved with these cars. Uh, now that's a treasure because that in itself is a part of the car's this history. This is a part of the car's history. We can now trace the car back before. I think last year we talked about the car. Uh, who owned the car as far as we could trace it back to around the early 40s and that was Barney Pollard out in the uh, Detroit area a big businessman who had one of the largest uh, automobile collections in the country uh, he owned this car along with about 799 other cars his collection was about 800 cars uh, and this was one of his 20 or 30 special cars that he had tucked away um, and as far as we can tell, uh, everything on the car when we received it was uh, original except the top. There had been somebody who put a new canvas top on it, but the leather was the original 1915-1916 leather. Um, and when we, and the car was drivable when we brought it home. Um, everything was there. So it has been taken completely apart. Uh, except we didn't take the motor apart. We, uh, the motor runs fine, so there was no need to do that. Um, Isn't that amazing all by itself? Yeah, yeah. The thing runs, uh, last time it was fired up, it, it ran very, very well. And the car rides very nice and it, uh, it sounds very sweet. It's got a very nice, smooth rumble to it. We were looking underneath it and we could see the leather, the leather boots and parts. They have, they have to little, it takes a little time to do that restoration, doesn't it? Oh yeah, there's a lot, a lot of hours into this project so far, and we've got a little bit ways to go yet. Um, but we're now in the assembly. We're going to have Don finish up the uh, the assembly, uh, or finish up the leather, and Eric's going to finish up the assembly. And hopefully, in the next month or two, we um, it will be completed. Um, along the way, besides the story of. Uh, the Lozier, as, as far as the uh, story about Don uh, needing time to actually do the leather work because of his health and his wife's illness, um, delayed some of the work. Um, there's a side story on the car, too. The fellow who was doing all the nickel plating, it's sort of a sad side story, but it's, it's what you go through in these projects. Uh, a fellow named Roman in Toronto, uh, we were sending all the pieces down to him, and he was doing the silver plating. And he went into his shop every morning at 6 o'clock, and his crew showed up at 7. Well, about three months ago, unfortunately, when the sh uh, crew showed up at 7 a.m., they found that uh, Roman had been murdered oh in a robbery. Oh, my God, come on. No, that's part that of the story no on this restoration, clue. too. And, um, Isn't it, that unbelievable? And we feel bad about that, but the side story... The other part of the side story is the fact that so we called down there and we said, well, gee, you know, we have all these parts down there and he was nickel plating the parts for us and we'd like the parts back. And the constable said, I'm sorry, it's a crime scene. You can't have the parts back right now. So we just got some of the parts back in the last couple of weeks. And that's delayed the, the whole project even longer. I wonder if it was ever solved. No, it hasn't been solved as Isn't far as we it? know. I want to walk around with you sure. and take a look at some of the the details of this restoration because this is such an incredible car just anything you want to talk about and because well, we, we got headlights yet to go on right? well the headlights need to be as yes, we're missing the headlights there um, they will be electric headlights compared to the national uh, that was sitting over there I don't know if you noticed the national actually has a settling headlamps there is no electric uh, headlamps on that car I looked there. at the tail the tail lamp we'll call it on the national and it's I think it had a name on it never out or something yeah like that. yeah <laughs> isn't that beautiful yeah well there's um, we we don't have uh, the there's a small accessory tank that should sit on the side of that car 
uh, but we're not planning on running it uh, that way because of the safety factor obviously we're gonna have to uh, we're planning on doing some wiring in that car and put some electric lights inside the uh, the containers uh, but you can see um, it's been taken apart it's been cleaned uh, metals been sandblasted buffed whatever need to give it a nice nice surface and then it was uh, painted um, do you like the color by the way oh we love the color do you know where we got the color from no you want to take a guess? I can't even imagine. That's Toyota Maroon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, leave it to the Japanese. Yeah, Isn't that, that beautiful? Actually, Toyota Maroon. That is a Toyota paint color uh, that we selected. We like the tone of it. We like the, the color, the quality of the paint. Um, that's what we decided to go with. It what, was what, what we wanted. What color was it new? Do you know? Well, it was... It was um, as far as when we got it, it was a blue, and in fact, it's in those uh, pictures down there on the running boards. It was a real ugly blue. Was and, it really? Oh, I, and I, I have, find it hard to believe it left the factory that way. Um, somebody uh, oh, did yeah, a paint I'm job. I'm sure it did not. No, it, it does not mm. look uh, anything like uh, the vehicle now that we're looking at. Um, but somebody had given it a real awful blue color. <laughs> now, this is a type 82 Lozier as opposed yeah. to other types and there probably aren't too many 82's left right anywhere as far as we know we actually think this is the only one left in the world we don't know of another 82 we've uh, uh, talked to enough people at least in the United States who own Lozier's or know about Lozier's and nobody comes forth with another 82 and in fact the 20 or 25 Lozier's that are left out there uh, you know, the most you're going to find is two or three in a given model year. Um, that's all that remains. This was, this and there was an 84, which was a very similar car. They were brought out together. Um, this was the last of the line. Uh, so as far as we know, this may be the youngest Lozier in the country. Um, the last one that's uh, the, mo the most current one, if so to speak. Uh, it's a six-cylinder. Um, there's three cylinders in each one of those uh, pots, those cylinder pots as you, you're looking at there. Um, and the interesting thing is you can see how the engine um, and all the accessory mountings and going back into the flywheel casing and then across the over to the frame, you see this is all cast. This is all one big piece, even coming across here uh, where you mount the accessories. We have the water pump. Everything's driven off the front of the car. We have the water pump. And we have a generator and a magneto uh, that just fits right across through here. So there's a line of uh, components um, that are driven off the front of the motor. Um, an amazing machine. Just yeah. an absolutely amazing machine. And the fact that the engine still ran without taking it apart. Yeah, yeah, it ran very well. Um, an interesting point of the, uh, the motor it's more down below, but actually, you feel it more down below because of gravity. If you run your fingers over the casing underneath, it feels oily. And what we've determined is uh, the metal, I mean, don't forget, we're looking at something 85 years old. All metals are actually porous. And what has happened over the 85 years is the oil in the casing has actually worked its way through the pores. Think and about it's, that. And it's actually sweating oil underneath. And you, if you take a towel underneath and wipe it down and get it clean and come back 15 minutes later, you can feel just a thin layer of oil. There's no cracks in it. It's just over the years, it's just all sort of diffused through the metal. And it continues to uh, leach out. Uh, it's not a problem. It's, it's, uh, it's an not interesting gonna, fact. It's an interesting fact, and it's not going to stop the car from running. You know what amazes me, among all the things that amaze me, because I find the world a fascinating place, is to look at a car of this age, to look at the National, and look at the, the Baker Electric and others, and to think in my mind how incredibly bright these engineers were back in those days, because Many of the features, the basic features on these 85, 90 year old automobiles are still being used today. Think about it. Well, they are. Um, you know, the basic operation of the motor hasn't changed. It's still based on the auto cycle. Um, we're still doing this. It's a four stroke engine back then. We're still doing the same thing now. The transmissions are essentially the same. Uh, the brakes, 
fortunately, fortunately, the brakes are much improved over the years yes. um, because trying to stop one of these things is a challenge. Uh, driving the National, um, actually we cheat a little bit with the National. What happened with that is uh, these cars used to have uh, cables just like on a bicycle for the brakes. Um, and in the restoration of the National, what was decided, which other people have done in these old cars, is they installed hydraulic lines. There's actually hydraulic brakes on that car. I noticed that. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> and, Nothing uh, wrong with that, because I've no. driven a lot of cars with cables and, and the old rod brakes. Yeah, well. And, uh, they bent and broke and twisted. And yeah, well, it's, it's the National. You get it up to about 60 mile an hour, and tra it, it, there's a lot of weight there in that vehicle. That's solid, and even with the hydraulic brakes, it's a little hard to bring it to a stop. Um, but Lozier was uh, well, well advanced. Um, he used quite a bit of ball bearings in the motor and in the transmission and other parts of the car, which was a first for that era. He actually developed, uh, not on this car, but some of his cars had water-cooled brakes, which didn't come back into vogue till 1950 when uh, it was Jaguar or somebody I'm not sure which make, I think it was a British car company, uh, ran water-cooled brakes at Le Mans for the 24-hour race. Um, and people in the last few decades have been doing that for racing purposes. Um, so he had a lot of foresight on uh, you know, so how, to, uh, how to build these things and, and make them work well. Um, and yeah, I mean, you, you talk about the quality of the work here. I mean, this car is now 85 years old. And as we said several times now, you can jump in it once it's back together, jump in it, fire it up, and it'll run. It'll just take off up the road. Um, no, I, I know you've had, let, I want to walk up this way a little bit and just yeah, look inside. And, Are we going to get you in this? Oh, 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 I'm not sure you're ready for that. Well, I don't know. I, look at this. Just take a look at this. Isn't this incredible? Now, you, you had a... Lozier steering wheel before you had a Lozier car, didn't you? Right. In fact, the, the wheel is sitting over there. I have two wheels now. I have uh, the one sitting over there on the table, and then the other wheel that I have it's, uh, came from the uh, Mulford estate, which is Ralph Mulford uh, was the race car driver who drew, uh, raced these vehicles. Uh, we actually picked up a steering, steering wheel from his collection. We don't know what car came off of it. It apparently was some, some, something very special for him to keep. Um, I'm looking at the flooring here. This is a well. This is a cork. This um, this is a cork that's uh, been now. I believe Eric, you can see, uh, has covered it uh, with a spray um, to protect it, uh, like a clear coat. Uh, you can see the uh, the nickel plating we've done on all the uh, pieces off the instruments. Um, Just to cover the seats was no small task, and do it so it looks great. Well, Don, Don said this was the biggest car he ever tackled. Um, really? Yeah. He, uh, as you can see, this is a very large car. And um, uh, apparently uh, he used 15 or 16 hides. Wow. Uh, and uh, I think he went, had to go back. He had to go back and get one or two more. He, wasn't, he, he underestimated what he thought. <laughs> oh, it, uh, really? He didn't realize what he was getting into when he uh, started working on this car. Now we got folding like opera seats here yeah. in, the, in the in the center. Yeah, these uh, little seats that um, we still have the carpeting to finish in here. Let's see if I can get this to occur. Uh, let's see. You gotta understand. It. It's been a while. You can tell he's never been in the back seat. No, no, I never. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, those, those will fold back out of the way, um, so you have three in the back, and then uh, two or three in the front, and then you have your two seats. And I have my two daughters, Lauren and Paige, and we've been thinking about putting Lauren on one of them and Paige on the other, and saying, okay, girls, this is where you have to sit. Are there side curtains? Yeah, well, there are, there are side curtains for this vehicle that would cover this up completely for uh, foul weather driving. Um, and we do have the side curtains. I, I don't know where they are today. They were under, when we got the car, it appeared that we had the original side curtains from it. They were tucked under the seat. No okay. um, Yeah, so we think that uh, we've got the original ones from there. And Eric's, Eric's out there is tucked away somewhere. They didn't use real glass, but they used Isinglass, didn't they, in the curtains? Or uh, Well, the curtains is what I, I would refer like to. For windows? Well, the they, they, uh, the side curtains are actually more of a plastic material plastic. because of folding. You can yeah. fold them up and tuck them in. Um, and they just fold up nicely and, and um, you can take, that way you can take them with you wherever you go. 
And then we have the uh, bar to hold on to in case the driver's uh, deciding to drive at a high rate of speed. <laughs> so This is so neat. I didn't realize there was a keyed ignition in these, but there was, wasn't yep, there? Yep, uh, <clears throat> there was. Um, the National, no, the National, uh, that's the other thing, I don't know if anybody pointed out to you about the National, we cheated on that one too. Did you really? If you open up the one little panel between, between the seats and you lift up the panel so you're not supposed to know that it's there, you reach in and press the button for the electric starter. <laughs> no Did cranking. you ever try to crank that thing? No, I, I tried cranking it. Uh, you, I think you were talking about the size of the motor. It took everything I had to get a one, ro one rotation out of the crank. I mean, really? it, I was just both hands pulling up. It is and tough. If it ever kept, kicked back, you'd have a broken yeah, arm. Yeah, you would. You would. So that uh, we ch that got that car, we cheated there, too. We uh, hit an electric starter on you. Just press the button, it fires up re really nice. How, how often do you drive the National? Uh, I try to get it out once a week. Um, I've been, you know, I just picked, the, just acquired the car in the last six weeks. Uh, oh, you did? I, oh, yes. No, I've just got it. I've had it out a few times. Um, it, it runs very well. Uh, we have a little bit of a problem with it. It keeps snapping a pin in the magneto, and because of that, the, the timing goes out. And, of course it uh, does. And uh, that's what happened this morning. I actually had it running this morning, to, took it down the driveway and up into the truck and uh, the trailer to get it here, and then it started misfiring. And when I got it here this morning, I took a look and saw where the pin had snapped again. We're going to have to come up with something a little bit more substantial. Uh, there's a lot of torque in that motor. And, well, can and you just, imagine that many cubic inches? Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, like a truck motor, and yeah. uh, it's got a lot of power behind it. And uh, so we have a little bit of a problem there. Hard to believe that with 50 horsepower, you could get that kind of speed out of a car. But it's a lot different. The way we do things is a lot different than it is today. Well, yeah, um, it is a lot different. And then when they say 50 horsepower, that was an old rating system. And I think it'd be more than that nowadays. But still, more. what's more than that? Maybe 70, 80, 90 yeah. horsepower. But um, certainly not the horsepower we're used to talking about. But it's, it's got a tremendous amount of torque in it because of the stroke. It's got a six inch stroke in the motor and that gives it a lot of torque, a lot of push. Um, but to answer your other question is, uh, the plans with these cars are to drive them. Um, we are, they are for display purposes, but uh, I mean half the fun of them is getting in them and firing them up and going down the road. And, and imagine what it was like in 1916, huh? Well, <laughs> It's, uh, you got to remember, the roads were pretty bumpy back then and uh, dirty and uh, dusty and you were confronting uh, people on bicycles and horses and everything else. Um, but it is, it's fun to drive them. It, it, it takes some muscle though. It's, it's amazing how much uh, steering uh, input way, you yeah. have to give the car, <laughs> how, it, how much effort it takes to turn. You know, I want to talk a little bit more about the progress of your committee in this uh ambitious plan of yours to start a transportation museum here in the North Country, hopefully on Plattsburgh Air Force Base. Uh, it's come a long ways, baby, but it still has a long ways to go. It has a long way to go. It's, it's about eight months ago I concluded it's, it's going to be a lifelong project for us, uh, certainly for me. Um, get out from underneath here. Um, we've made very good progress in the fact that uh, We've generated a lot of interest. We've proven to the city that it's a viable project. Um, we've been working with the Battle of Plattsburgh group and some of the other groups here in town. And um, under the mayor's guidance, uh, we've been drawing all these committees together, all these groups together. And to have one large museum, uh, what the mayor likes to term, uh, call a museum mall, uh, is a great idea. And we can do it. We certainly have enough. Um, we are now in the process of grant writing and like all these projects that's what it takes uh, but there are people surprising there's so many people out there that want to help us um, I got a phone call from a Frank Gardner two weeks ago and uh, Frank is the curator at the new automobile museum that started up in Saratoga Springs and after a few minutes of conversation I just said very nicely but bluntly to him I said okay Frank why are you calling? Are you calling to check out what we're doing and see what kind of competition we are for you or what? And he says, no. He says, honestly, I was told to call our, my board of, the board of directors, the head of the board of directors, asked me to give you a call because they saw your article in the newspaper about the Dodge that you have now in the museum. And uh, 
he asked me to give you a call and say that we would like to work with you and help you. And so I spent the next 45 minutes speaking to this fellow, obviously very knowledgeable, uh, certainly has been around in this type of work, uh, knows what he's doing, and I think he was very sincere when he said, look, when you need help, just give me a call and I will do whatever I can to guide you. Uh, you're, you're starting your grant writing, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll help you, I'll, I'll, whatever it takes. And um, I must say, you know, to give him a plug for, because he was so nice to me over the phone, he told me over the phone his collection they currently have. Now, what they're doing down there in Saratoga Springs is they only own a few cars, but they get the cars on loan, either from businesses, other museums, or private individuals. And that's one of the things we were hoping to do. Once we get established up here, that'll be open to us too, available to us too, that we'll be able to, you know, borrow things for six months at a time, bring it in. And he apparently right now down in Saratoga Springs has 29 cars, uh, including, I believe he told me, the Formula One car that won the 1952 Monaco Grand Prix. That's been put on loan to them. He's got some very, very interesting uh, cars. He has uh, what is could be called the original Firebird on loan from Pontiac. It was a show car. Uh, it was a very, it was a prototype, a very way out car, something they never came close to building. But apparently has it sitting down there right now. Um, so, you know, there's, we're looking at the same thing. If we can just get a little bit farther, um, get a little bit more established, get some more funding behind us, uh, there's no reason why we can't do that up here. We're making new contacts all the time. I told Tony when I came here that several people interested in the history of the Lozier, and some of them almost directly contacted or connected with it, have called me or written to me over the last few weeks. Not the least of which is uh, Mrs. Charles Stoughton, whom I understand had uh, a mother and father who both worked in the Lozier plant here mm -hmm. and has a great deal of memorabilia, which we're gonna try to tap into. And a gentleman from uh, who now lives in Sleepy Hollow, near the stamping grounds of my uh, ancestors down near Terrytown, who claims that his grandfather drove the Lozier in the Indy 500, and he has a huge amount of memorabilia that he would just love to share. So we're going to hook him up with Tony. These are, these kinds of discoveries are nice, aren't they? Well, we turn them on. Yes, they're wonderful, and, and 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 we keep turning these kind of discoveries up every month or two. Somebody f comes forth with some more interesting things. Uh, we recently just received a nice uh, donation from Bill Gregware. I don't know if anybody talked to you today about it so no. far. Well, Bill um, lives out on Shazy, or maybe Shazy Landing is the proper uh, place uh, name of the place. But anyways. Bill called me and he said, I have an old doctor's Surrey, and in fact it's the one that's sitting over there off to the side. He says, um, I'd like to donate, I'd just like to do something nice and donate it to the museum project. So Ron Venn and I got in the truck and the trailer and went out there one Saturday and he got, we go to his barn and he's got about four or five buggies there and about three or four sleds, beautiful little sleds. Um, this is all new to me, they were calling bob cutters sleds. Yeah. And he's looking around, and we're looking around, and he goes, eh, just take whatever you want. Oh, that's not so bad. We, you, you've seen how big my trailer is. Uh, two trips. Uh, uh, two trips. And uh, we brought it all back, and we've got it covered up and protected. Um, he gave us a number of items, uh, and all of this is from the late 1800s, and it all belonged to his family out there. It's all farm-related items. Um, and we walked away saying, you know, once we take these pieces and clean them up, some of them we just need to clean, some we want to restore, uh, like our Dr. Surrey over there. Um, we have a whole room, just from what Bill gave us, we literally have enough to do a whole room of a museum. A nice display of late 1800 items that were here, that traveled the roads here, uh, and the fields here in Plattsburgh. If people want to write you out a nice check or give you an old uh, brochure, catalog, a letter connected with Lozier, any other kind of memorabilia, how do they get a hold of you, Tony? Well, they can reach me uh, by calling 563-9339. Uh, they can reach me at the Cancer Center, uh, the Fitzpatrick Cancer Center during the day, which is 562-7120. Or I live out on Lighthouse Road, 101 Lighthouse Road. 
uh, and they can stop by or write me there. Um, and we do have a 5013C, a uh, charter through the Chamber of Commerce, that all items, for example, the items that Bill Gregware gave us, um, those go to the museum. They don't go to me. Any money, any items, they don't go to me. They go to the uh, to the uh, charter, to the uh, corporation, under the control of the Chamber of Commerce, and Gary Douglas uh, heads that portion up. Um, and then they will be dispersed, uh, money will be dispersed for use as appropriate for the project, and any items uh, donated to us uh, are tucked away for the moment, and uh, plan whatever plans we come up with, we would implement then as far as using them. This, this museum concept is, is really still in its infancy. Realistically, what do you look at? You said a lifetime project, but what can we plan? Can we at least dream about when some kind of facility might be open? Well, the bare bones will be open this September. What's happened is the, chain, the uh, Battle of Plattsburgh organization uh, is going to lend us a building out on the Air Force Base right next door to the building that they're using. Um, and what we're going to do is set up some of the memorabilia you see here and the cars. Um, we're going to be set up for the weekend of the Battle of Plattsburgh and it's going to be at the shuttle point where the shuttle buses will be taking people into Plattsburgh. Not so bad, you, not yeah, you bad. come out and you park your car and while you're waiting for the shuttle bus please come in and take a look at what we have. So that's planned and then hopefully this winter we'll use that building or one of the buildings out there with the Battle of Plattsburgh to do some children's. I'd like to see some children's events. We're going to have some simple children's events down at uh, the Mayor's Cup in two weeks time. Uh, we're going to have a tent set up there. We have the parking lot across from Iris's Cafe. Uh, we're going to have Lego races and we're going to have uh, the kids will be able to come and build Lego cars and race them down a ramp. Uh, one of our sponsors, Booth Construction, is, is working on the ramp and imagine that is helped us get some of the Lego parts. Um, Amy Valentine over at Imagine's at, Imagine That has helped me out quite a bit. Um, and then we're going to build some paper helicopters for the kids to have fun with, and we may even have some sailboat races uh, planned uh, right there in the parking lot. Um, so kids are invited, parents are invited to bring their children. It's all free. Uh, we'll have a display there of the cars and the memorabilia. Um, so we'll have that set up. And then it's finally, you know, I'd like to see in the next year or two a, a really a nice building that's been finished um, and permanently houses all these items. And from there we just grow. I mean, I, uh, I can't see why we can't have airplanes and we can't have trains and buses and trolleys and everything else out there. I think it should be obvious to our viewers <coughs> and those people who have followed the progress of your um, idea as it's germinated and hopefully will soon come into uh, fruition that you have the passion it takes to get there from here because I know this means a great deal to you Tony and I think you uh, w will engender that kind of passion and the other people in your committee but I would also urge those people who are viewing this program today to get in touch with you and get involved because it's never quite enough to sit back and say gee that's nice no, that's, that's true. We need people, we need help, uh, we need finances, and we need manpower. And I've got 13 or 14 committees uh, established, um, or need to be established, within the organization of the museum. And we're looking for people to slot into those different committees. Education, uh, collections, finance, uh, publicity, etc. We just go down the list. And if there's any, anybody out there who's extremely motivated, and very interested in seeing a museum occur here in Plattsburgh, please get in touch with me and we will put you on the committee and we will work you to death probably, no, I'm just I love it. <laughs> Take but, a deep breath and eat some Wheaties for breakfast because you're going to be busy. But you will also do a great thing for the city of Plattsburgh and in all of this I definitely want to have part of our museum geared for the youth both as entertainment and education. And that would make me very happy if uh, the youth of this town, the city, would have a place to go to and learn and, and have fun. Because over the last few years I've taken my daughters across the country and visited places like that. We were at the Children's Museum in Boston last month getting some ideas, trying to collect some good ideas uh, for our museum project. And, you know, we spent a day there. My daughters had a wonderful time and walked away with a good experience. Uh, and I, I don't see why we can't have that in Plattsburgh. Uh, down there in uh, Boston, they have um, 
Jumpstart and PBS of Boston behind them, financially backing them. But, uh, you know, there's no reason why we can't get one of our big corporations here. Or I don't see why we can't get Ford or General Motors or somebody behind this project. Um, that is not beyond, uh, that, that's a possibility as far as I'm concerned. You well, know, there are some real good reasons for that too, because the Ford family uh, spent quite a bit of time here in the North Country in the old days. Uh, Mr. Ford and some other famous people whom we've heard and read about used to go on these camping expeditions through the Adirondack region. And believe me, they drove through Plattsburgh and up and down the old Route 9 many times way back in the early part of the 20th century. So they do have a connection here. Oh, they certainly do. And, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the nice stories I heard not too long ago, and I understand uh, the family still in the Adirondacks, uh, did you ever wonder why uh, all Fords up until the 70s or into the 80s, before they came out with fuel injections, why um, they all had Holly carburetors? Because Holly, the Holly family, have a place down in the Adirondacks, and Henry Ford used to visit with them, and apparently were best friends. Is and that's, <laughs> that's why there's always been Holly carburetors on Ford, is what oh, I've been boy. told. Um, no, Henry Ford used to come up here uh, into this area, and you're right, the, uh, the, these kind of cars used to tour this area. Um, some of the most richest and most famous people in our country have come up here to the Adirondacks in our backyard, uh, and still do, actually. Uh, they still come up, and we just don't know about it. They come up very quietly. Um, it's but great I to have them here, and I, I want to see this thing move move forward I want to be able to come back every year and see what progress we've made I'd love to see a building open by next year what we're going to do is take a walk around and take a look at uh, some of the memorabilia you've amassed for this day on Plattsburgh Air Force Base if you don't mind sure go uh, we can take a look let's do it okay well there's a picture of the man who's responsible for the whole thing Tony well I believe so I believe this is the father actually oh, yeah. um, I believe this is the father uh, who was into building the bicycles the American bike company out of Toledo and uh, I believe it was Cincinnati um, and he was the one who came to the Adirondacks and his son uh, was also known as Harry Lozier. Um, I believe his real name was Henry, uh, but he called himself Harry like his father. He was the one who got involved with the actual automobiles and was responsible for the automobile racing and uh, the building of the cars. Um, and on the other side of that post we have the picture of the mother, uh, Mrs. Lozier, and uh, I'm taken by the uh, clothes that she's in and, and uh, yeah, she's a very elegant woman as you can see and she's very well dressed. Um, it's no doubt high society. Oh yes. Uh, yes. Well you know these, as we said before, these were not uh, assembly line automobiles per se. These cars were painstakingly built by hand uh, starting from scratch and were rather expensive actually back in those days trying to hold things up here because we get, get a little shot of wind comes through the tent every now and again and knocks the posters down and we're doing the best job we can at displaying things here <laughs> a little shot of wind the weatherman well, I know I'm here. unfortunately we got a windy day here today yeah and uh, well, just go around it and tell us a little bit about what we're looking at as Calvin, Calvin shoots it. Start right over here in the corner. That's well, the famous building. This is the building in the typical winter North scene, Country North winter. Country winter scene. Uh, and what we have are pictures of the cars. Uh, for example, here is a picture of the car being tested. Um, the cars were heavily tested before they went to the uh, customers. Uh, the story is, is the cars were run for several hundred miles. Uh, through the Adirondacks uh, in that kind of condition without the bodywork, without the fenders um, and they were just driven around and they were brought back to the factory and they were taken apart uh, and all the components were checked and then they were reassembled and sent off to the customer and that was part of the reason why these cars cost five to seven thousand dollars back then. People t tell repeat stories their fathers and grandfathers told about the Lozier's going up and down Margaret Street yeah in the dead of winter trying yeah. them out to make sure they ran well as we walk down through here we'll probably see some pictures like that um, we have here's a picture of inside the uh, plant uh, that is now the uh, Georgia Pacific um, building 
Uh, here's a motor being tested by the engineers. And we have several pictures of this where the mechanics or the engineers working on them, they're all very well dressed. Uh, they, some of them have suits on, nice clothes. Um, here's a picture right here of one of the cars being tested. Uh, another picture back also there. And here you can see the assembly of the vehicles um, as, as they were uh, in the factory. Um, as we move down, here I think is a picture of the sun. Uh, you can see the difference between this and the other photo. Uh, but that was actually the sun, the gentleman who was uh, responsible for building the cars. Um, Lozier, the car that lacks nothing. nothing. Yes, this is. Um, they did a lot of very beautiful prints. Um, yes, this prices. car, uh, thirty-two hundred fifty. Uh, the limousine was forty-four hundred dollars. Uh, the coupe was a steal at thirty-eight hundred dollars. Um, Lozier's were used uh, for calendars. Um, and then as we come down through here, this is uh, special to me. Um, this is the Horseless Carriage uh, Gazette. Uh, I believe this was two years ago in September. And this is about an eight or nine page article on Lozier, the greatest endurance car in the world. Uh, the quality was so high of these vehicles, they just run forever. And it tells a very nice story about all the different models of the car, how the cars were constructed, and it has it gets into the racing history and as you get into the next to the last page down here it has the specifications on all the vehicles but what's special to me is that photograph um, of this car that they have down here does, does this photograph here look like anything you've seen today? Yes it certainly <laughs> looks like the, that is your car then. Yeah it is that is that's the 82. Were you uh, surprised to see it in the magazine? Uh, I was well it? yeah I, well we we knew about it um, but uh, that is the car uh, right before I purchased it that photograph no was kidding. taken. <laughs> so it was intact it looked it was intact and good. running back then unfortunately it was a uh, color that was not very tasteful um, and we still joke about it. In fact, we still call when I talk to Eric and I s ask him about the car. I always refer to it as Big Blue. <laughs> Big Blue. And Eric and I always know that know the vehicle is Big Blue. Hey, watch out! I'd be able to sue you for that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Here's a photograph I picked up. Um, this is actually uh, Ralph Mulford, uh, the driver, uh, in the race car that uh, won the Vanderbilt Cup down in Savannah, Georgia and then took second place at the Indianapolis 500 in 1911. And that's from a newspaper, that's an original ad that I uh, was able to get from a collector. And then there's other photographs that you can see here of inside the plant. I love this picture. Um, <coughs> this is looking down inside the plant. You can see the drive shaft that went across that powered all the equipment down below, all the lathes, all the machines. I, Tony, I was told yesterday by a current employee of Georgia Pacific that he's positive that a steam crane that was used in the Lozier days still exists upstairs in that uh, in that old building. Uh, there could be. There could be. I had actually. Uh, I want to find out about that. Well, I actually had talked to the um, I talked to the plant engineer who I know personally, and I uh, asked him that about two years ago. I said, you got anything left over there? And he said, no. He says, I can tell you there's nothing left. So I don't, it'd, be, it'd be worth taking a look someday. I would love to. Yeah. All right, let's find out what else we have here. Well, as we round the corner, we... Um, Let me Cal Calvin get over here. We have um, an article over there that I, I just adore. Um, it talks about the racing history of Lozier, and I had copied that and had it blown up. It was in Auto Week. Um, and it tells the story, uh, the racing history, and how successful they were. And they really made a mark in early auto racing uh, between the year of 1907 and 1911. Uh, I do have some pictures here. Uh, another, another very nice article that uh, was written by Ralph Mulford himself, the race car driver. Uh, this was published in around 1975, and it's his memoirs. And it has some wonderful photographs in here of Lozier when they used to race the car. And that's Ralph right there. And that's the other, that's the co-driver, Teddy Tetzlaff. Uh, but that's how the car looked right there at Indianapolis.
Um, and the cars did race in the Savannah Cup races, which is called the Vanderbilt. We really do have problems here with the wind today. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, the Savannah races and also later on in the Santa Monica races. Um, and then moving down, we have some more ads. These are all full page ads that came out of magazines such as Life or Country Life in America. Uh, they always did these beautiful one page color ads. Uh, we have a photograph of, um, this is actually, take a closer look at that. That is of the plant with a Lozier car going up the road. That's kind of neat. Yeah, we thought so. And then what I found, this I was actually lent to me by, uh, from Dr. Uh, Frank Schumacher. Um, Plattsburgh Traction Company. It's a book about, it's a whole oh, book sure. devoted to the trolley system that used to be here in Plattsburgh. Uh, Lozier built boats. Uh, and more ads as you see. And then the models that I believe you may have taken a look at. Look yes, at we've seen them, and these are the newest ones that uh, Ron Venn has yes, made. Yes, this, this is the uh, Indianapolis race car, and and that's great. Um, some more ads. Um, we have pictures of the plan. Here's a picture of the design staff. Uh, the picture of the actual uh, the engineers, the design staff of Lozier. Great photograph. Yeah. Wow. Once again, here's the staff, actually, people who are working. And pictures of the plant, both inside and out. You know, people who drive by <laughs> the intersection of Boynton Avenue and North Margaret Street look to the right, and parts of it have changed with a basic. Uh, structure and shape of the structure still well if, if you drive up through there you'll see a building where the walls slant out and the building's bright yellow right now and in fact I believe now there's a building in front of it yes. out to the street um, but that is the original plan and if you look at this if you look at the back of that building if you go back around Cumberland Avenue there uh, behind the building and you take a look you can see the area out there and there was used to be a ramp that ran right down into the lake. So we, when they first built boats in that building, they just rolled them right out the back into Lake Champlain. Makes perfect sense to me. And then they had a, uh, what I understand was a uh, rock crib wall right along there. It burned down or something happened to it. I, something about a fire occurred. Uh, but that's where they used to launch the boats and then they would test them right there. Love it. These old photographs are great. Some of these are actually or the original photographs. Yes, right yes. <laughs> Yeah, they got, guys were dressed pretty, got their shoes shined and everything. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. oh, that was before unions, I think. <laughs> oh, boy. And you are collecting memorabilia all the time. Was that number eight on your car when you got it? No, I put that on. Oh, that was actually that. the number that Joe Dawson used when he won the 1912 uh, oh, Indianapolis. Yeah, I, the Indianapolis uh, 500. Uh, that was the number he had on the car. Uh, we're hoping this fall to take the car to Lime Rock, Connecticut for the vintage car racing. What we will do is uh, pull all the brass items off of it, pull the fenders and running boards off, take the top off, and uh, it's a real live race car. This, that's how Are they you going to drive it, Tony? Absolutely. <laughs> you wouldn't miss it. I wouldn't world. miss it. No, I, I promised Eric a driver's suit. I already have mine. I have to get him a driver's suit. He is going to be the riding mechanic. And uh, when we say race it, uh, there are people actually that will take these cars out and run them full bore. Uh, we plan to make a demonstration run. Uh, I would, I yeah, would think it's so. it's sort of the smart thing to do. I would uh, be a little testy to try this thing well, at 70 miles an hour. A lot of people have been killed. A lot of the race car drivers were killed driving these cars. Of I mean, course. you could see. I mean, they rolled over on you. They snapped a wheel when it wouldn't spoke or something. Roll over on you'd be you'd be dead. Um, there's no protection at all. Uh, but we do plan to take the car to Lime Rock and run it, um, and that's the uh, that last weekend of August that sort of split over August into September. Uh, it's apparently a very big event. I've never been to it before, um, but there are many cars that show up uh, from the early teens all the way up into the 80s, vintage race cars, and uh, it's pretty spectacular. So it's worth a four-hour drive. That's great. You know what I'd like to do? I'd like to go take a look at this Baker Electric while we're still in... Wow, yeah, look at that. Looks like a tube of that horn. Yeah, yeah well, that's oh, the horn. a huge bulb in the back. Yeah. 
Oh boy, and I bet it really makes a good noise. Too, well, it right? does. Right? It does. Um, <laughs> let me go show you if I can climb. Yeah, go ahead. I want you to get back there and squeeze it. Probably we got it. You know, yes, it'll thing. work. I can tell it'll that work. Give it a shot. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Now, if that doesn't chase the cows off the road. Uh -huh. Boy, that's pretty loud. That would do it. <laughs> See that? We, we, I couldn't help it. Yeah, you thought it was me. Give me a break. Let's take a look at this Baker Electric. This caught my eye. Eric? This caught my eye the second I arrived here. Even before Calvin, it's the first time I've ever beat Calvin to any event in my life. And I saw this car going by and it wasn't making any noise. And I said to Randy at the gate, Baker Electric. Eric. This is Eric Edwards. How are you doing? Eric Edwards, great to see you again. Thank you. We love it. We love well, we're, this We just love to come down here. It's wonderful to come down. Uh, we decided that uh, with the car and the trailer already, it was a natural to come. So. Linda said, yeah, let's take the Baker Electric. <laughs> you know, to let our viewers know, once again, this is a very rare automobile. There's probably about 10 Bakers known, on, well, at least on our list. And um, Jay Leno's got a car. We heard about the Jay um, Leno experience. You did hear about that. You that got in nice. out there, didn't you? Yeah, it was very nice. Have you ever seen so many cars in your life? He's, he's got a lovely collection, and he's such a gentleman. Um, there are a couple of local cars, um, but most of them are open. They're not closed bakers. Now, Jay's is a closed car like this, very similar. I think it's a 1909, but uh, basically the same car. This one is a 72 volt system, 48 volt electric motor, uh, first shaft driven automobile. No kidding, yeah. I wasn't aware of that too. Well, right Baker now. was involved with American Ball Bearing Corporation, and, and you'll find a lot of cars have American Ball Bearing, I mean, they, in all machinery applications. And that's what really put Baker on the map as far as his financial success was concerned. But uh, Baker, later on, uh, merged with uh, Roush and Lang and formed the Baker Rowlang Company. And up until the 40s, and I, I, they may still be in business now, but they were making um, heavy equipment lift forks and they used them heavily during the war period uh, for manufacturing. And um, very, very uh, durable, uh, very innovative. Um, they were they were really the uh, the cream of the crop when it came to electric cars. That's beautiful. We I want to get up here a little bit closer to point out to our viewers that these aren't metal fenders. No, these are supposed to be patent leather fenders. Now these ones have been uh, re-sewn. I don't know how many years ago. We we bought this car in this condition. Oh, did you really? And, yeah, this car came from Washington State last year, and um, we finally located uh, an Amish buggy maker. Um, leather man that can properly reproduce these um, the patent leather because patent leather is very very shiny oh, yeah. and uh, it, it takes a special skill to be able to make them properly so everything takes a oh, special sure. skill and there's so many rebuilding the lozier takes a special skill yes, that, you know everybody's got something that they, they can uh, be proud of and um, you know we're very fortunate that that uh, a lot of the people that we know are, are talented too and uh, I mean, we, ha we have a ball with this stuff. My wife just loves it. My granddaughter loves it. Drives up and down the driveway. She's four. How many people do you know that at the age of four can operate a vehicle without any difficulty? And this is the way electric cars were. You know, I'm sure many people now are hearing an awful lot in the media about the new hybrid cars that mm -hmm. are on the market mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. And they think, wow, electric car, what a great new idea. Nothing new on the planet. <laughs> Not at Nothing all. Nothing new. Now, they haven't really made big strides as far as electric car technology is concerned. The big limitation is distance, uh, the, the duration of the charge. You know, in order to get 70 miles range, I had to charge this car overnight. Um, they have made some improvements over the years as far as batteries uh, are concerned, but really when you get down to it, they really haven't solved the problem of distance. They haven't solved um, the battery problem. Um, the hybrid made, car hy ma makes some strides. Yeah, hybrid car has solved one problem and that's the pollution in the city. Because when you come to a stop, 
your car reverts to the electric car mode for for most people that don't know about the hybrid car now if you drive the, the hybrid car under normal conditions once you get past 20 or 25 miles an hour the gas mode kicks in and it drives like a conventional car so you benefit in the city by not producing emissions you know you, you don't have any pollutants when you're stuck in traffic the vehicle is not running and then when you move off it, you know in in gridlock or in bumper to bumper you're in the electric mode so you're not polluting so you have uh, city driving is more efficient than country driving now rather than the, the conventional way of, of thinking where a gas vehicle pr produces more efficiency on the highway than in the city so there, there's a few um, strides um, there's really not a lot of saving because if you really wanted savings, you'd buy a, a Volkswagen Jetta or a Golf because you'll get better fuel economy. I think the hybrids are running around 45 to 47. Yeah, and 47 would be in the city and maybe 41 or two on the highway. But uh, they, uh, they perform, they perform. We haven't even talked about steam cars. That was oh, a whole a other... A whole other ball game. They all have their drawbacks. Electric cars have their distance problems. Steam cars also have their problems. There are lots of power, but for every mile that you travel, you have to carry a gallon of water. Of course. And you have to be close to a water supply, other than the water that you're carrying with you. So there are restrictions. Have you ever owned a steamer? Not yet. You ready? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. It there are a few wonderful. Stanley still around. I, All I right, let's get up front here. Oh, yeah. The, um, yeah, we got energy it. source here. Okay. Now, what we have here is six deep cell, six volts in the front, and the same in the rear. And when we charge, we, we use a series charger, and we, we charge all 12, volt, all 12 batteries at the same time. So we're going to max out at about 90 volts when we have 72 volts worth of batteries. That's with a full charge. <laughs> okay. Okay, so that will give us probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 70, maybe 80 miles range. But it needs a full 12 hours to do a charge. And then an equalizing charge after that to maintain maximum um, voltage. Um, 20 miles an hour in the city, maximum speed. 20 miles an 20 hour, miles not an bad. Hour, six speeds two speeds in reverse, six speeds forward. It has a locking tiller. It also came out as a, as a steering wheel version car. Oh, it did? I didn't know They had that. both. They had, had a Model W, which was <laughs> a wheel. You see the tiller inside. And, and, the, and the tiller, which they That's... called the Model V. Oh, sure. Okay. And it flipped out of the way. Now, there is a lock here. There's a lock that locks the tiller in position. Oh. And it also locks the speed control for a safety device. Because if by chance you happen to hit the, the shifter and, and you put it in first gear and we're, we're in, in uh, emergency brake position, you would know that uh, you were in, in um, a consuming position and your resistors would start to heat oh, up. Sure. Then the next thing you know, you'd be on fire. Yes. And uh, that's one thing that uh, we like to do. We like to carry a fire extinguisher with us. I would think and so. um, this is, it was made in, in uh, Cleveland, Ohio and um, very, very, very popular cars. Uh, women, uh, it became women, mo uh, allowed women to become more mobile, more independent, because before 1912, all cars were hand crank. There was no electric starter. So to have an electric car, you didn't need to crank. So it made it very, very possible for uh, women to uh, get around town, do their shopping, socialize, um, become a little bit more independent. It looks like you drive it quite often. Well, my wife loves it all. She, loves she drives drive it, it all the time. Do you think you'll ever do a complete uh, restoration again? Oh, probably this winter. Really? Get mm -hmm. on it, huh? Mm-hmm. Is there ever a moment, Eric, when you're not thinking about cars? Probably uh, even when I'm sleeping, maybe. I don't <laughs> know. There are times. But you've been doing this kind of thing for a long, long time. <laughs> well, I started restoring um, in the mid-70s professionally. And um, it's been fun. 
Um, every every challenge is a is different. Um, right now, the Lozier's are wonderful projects, just so exciting. But um, every car that comes into the shop is different, and uh, from a different point of view, if you can continue to become or or to stay uh, enthusiastic about what you're working on and excited. You'll always have problems. Just talk to Tony Vaccaro once in a while and you'll have no trouble with the enthusiasm. Well, <laughs> we, we find that it's it's very contagious. Oh, I, I can't okay. help but be. That's right. And we're hoping that we can spread that contagion all over the North Country and uh, open up some <laughs> of the coffers if some people might want to support this project. We see that there's a lot of support for the project and we see a lot of people that are willing to open their wallets and their hearts um, and their enthusiasm too. They want to share. And I think uh, the, the doctor is just the project the whole concept is so good for the town um, for no uh, personal gain um, it's it's for the town it's for America and um, we just love to be involved in it uh, it is contagious very contagious we're delighted with the work you've done so far in the Lozier we much. can't wait to see what it's going to look like in a couple of months. Well, we should be done in about a month, maybe wow. sooner. Um, some things take a lot longer than others. Uh, one of them is upholstery and trim. And uh, we have a wonderful trimmer that works for us. He has been for 30 odd years for my family. His father worked for my father. And, um, no kidding. And it's, it's something that gets passed down and uh, you can't rush a labor of love and that's oh, of definitely the situation with Don Parsons. Um, what he's, a guy. He's Talk a, about history. He's, a he's got wonderful history guy. in every pore of his body. Oh, definitely, definitely. Well to tell you how sincere the man was, yesterday being Saturday he was working in my shop until seven o'clock last night and just so that I can have this car here for the the public to see today. Well, we're talking a man in his 80s. Isn't he's, he now? he's 73. 73. He's 73. Um, Friday night, I was at his shop. Uh, car was supposed to be ready. It wasn't. He worked late. Uh, he came over to my shop, which is a hundred miles away, oh. and I mean that's an hour, yeah. almost two hours of driving each way. So he's dedicated. That's right. He wouldn't be doing it if he didn't enjoy it, and he certainly wouldn't be doing it if it was for somebody else because he could be retired now. He does it for me because he just, I mean, we're so close and he loves nice projects. How many cars do you own personally? Well, between dad and myself and my son, we've got a couple of dozen cars. Some of them are um, in, um, in original condition, but most of them are restored and it's a lifetime of collecting. You know, every car is different and we have fun with each of them. That's wonderful. I, I can tell you do. And just as we said that, the, sun's out. the sun Isn't is out. So we, looking down on us. I don't want to thumb my nose yet at the weatherman because he still has the ultimate power. But we hope this is going to be a great day. Eric, thanks so much for coming Thank down. Thank you very much. Thanks for all your work you do. We're preserving, it. preserving some Plattsburgh area history. And uh, we'll add more chapters as time goes on. Definitely. Thanks Definitely. again. Thank you. Well, we haven't even taken two steps and already we have an addendum to add to this <laughs> story sure. because Calvin said how the heck did they charge the batteries in 1911 now we plug it in it was a little bit different back then and I think we ought to explain that for our viewers well when you bought an electric car there was a little bit more to it than just having the car or putting fuel in it you had to have a charging system and and back then they used a mercury arc rectifier that stood about seven or eight feet tall wow. it was fitted into the uh, carriage house that the car would be kept in and at night after a day's worth of driving you'd come home and plug in the mer the uh, it was usually in the back of the car and it was a triangular um, triangular device that you would could only put it in in one in one direction so that you couldn't change the polarity of course not and and you would be um, enlightened in how to charge it and, and how to set your controls and you'd have to just like we do today or try to do we keep our batteries at the proper specific gravity and um, if you keep the batteries charged continually you're gonna get the most life out of it. well I'm, I'm not an electrician, I'm not a battery person, but 
I talked to a couple of people and they said, and I'm asking, well, what do I do about storing my electric car in the winter? I said, well, you don't have to worry about it because the batteries go to sleep. I said, pardon me? Well, yeah, the, the, the rate of reaction slows down. It's a chemical reaction. So I said, okay, so what do I do? Well, just charge your car before you put it away for the winter, and it will dissipate very slowly. And then sometime during the winter, put it on charge again. You know, uh, don't take your batteries out. Just leave them where they are. And they will go to sleep. I Isn't said, I can't amazing? believe it. So I wouldn't realize that in the very cold weather, I would yeah. think. Yeah. I mean, it's... It, the least uh, efficient time for a battery, but the, it's a chemical reaction, and the chemical reactions slow down in cold weather. It's just like when you're doing your your chemical reactions in in uh, in the standard temperature and pressure. That you know that in lower temperatures everything slows right down. Isn't that it's delightful. Incredible. See how much you learn watching our little corner. I didn't know anything. This, <laughs> last year, I, w I was a greenhorn when it came to electric cars. Yeah. I mean, this is the key that, keep, that keeps the uh, the charging system or the, um, the the complete battery circuit in operation. Without this in, everything is dead. So I keep it in my pocket so nobody uh, like that idea. absconds <laughs> with the goods. Keep it's it also around a safe, your it's a safety device. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Once, once you pull it out, you're safe. I love it. Thanks again. You're Ash. quite welcome. <laughs> I, I I didn't really expect to have wonderful music accompaniment here today. <laughs> Helen and John could do a little dance for us. Helen and John Ionelli, how are you both? Good, just wonderful. It's great, great. Gordy. Good to well, see you again. You, John's and I and Helen go back many many years, <laughs> as many of our viewers already know, because. We each were chain smokers back in the old days, and when John would sit in my office, I mean the two of us, uh, we'd, we'd sit in our office and talk on the, talk on the radio, right? Right, it's a good thing we weren't on television. <laughs> they couldn't have seen us for the smoke. <laughs> when did, what year did you quit? 20 years ago, 1982. 75 for me, three and a half packs a day. It was about time. It was I about thought. the same quantity. Yeah, unbelievable. They've been interested in older cars for a long time. The pictures that we were looking at here are of what year is the Dodge? 1948. And you got married in? 52. Couldn't afford a new car back then. I think we spent all the $600 to buy that car. Isn't that <laughs> amazing? And the photographs include several different uh, time periods. First of all, when you were married, right? Yes. Okay. And then 25 years after that. And then 20. we went 25 years ago back to Rochester where we were married. And Helen's maid of honor and my best man are in the car in the 25-year-old picture. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> and then, 25 years after that, aren't you glad you quit smoking, John? <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> we wouldn't have been here. <laughs> Helen and I have served on committees and boards together, and she's been such an active part of this community. And you wouldn't give back one minute of all that service, would you, Helen? Not at all, no. Yeah. It's been fun all along. It's a, it's ups a, and downs, but fun. Ups and downs, but fun. It's a great place to, to make a living, to raise a family. And even though we like to take our little trips away, we like to come back, don't we, John? We sure do. Can't find a better place. Now, John, as I've said on this program and many others, was the former mayor of the city of Plattsburgh. What years, John? Uh, 1978 to 82. Does it seem possible that it was 78 to 82? <laughs> and how long ago did uh, did we uh, take our first little walk on the beach and build the sandcastles? Uh, I think it's... 18 or 19. This Years? Year. Years. Yes. Oh. That's wonderful. Well, John, you had a, a another business to sustain you besides being the mayor. Yes, oh, sure. I was in, a, in the petroleum business, distributor. But antique cars have been my love for many years. Always had a passion and always had a few of them tucked away. How many was the most you had? Boy. <laughs> Maybe four. <laughs> huh? Four at a time. Four at a time, right? Now you're down almost to none. Just the one, the important one. Is the Dodge going in the Transportation Museum? Yes, it is. We hope to. I, I think Dr. Vaccaro is doing a marvelous thing getting this started. To get the Transportation Museum to, for the whole history of the Clinton County, not just old cars, but to, to show what's happened in the county over the years. Railroads, the boats that were here on the lake, cars. It's going to be great. And if we get all the museums together on the old base, 
it's going to be a nice museum off. Uh, I, I want to see that brochure, boy, when we can send it to Oshkosh, Wisconsin and Kalamazoo, Michigan and get people to travel here and make special plans to come here because uh, I like what the plans are for the, for the waterfront. I like the new, the new boat that holds 500 people that'll travel around Lake Champlain. I like what I see here in Plattsburgh Air Force Base. And There's so, the Battle of Plattsburgh group oh, the, that are the, working. And you know, there are so yeah. many people now working, and hopefully this will be as a cohesive unit to just get people to come and discover what yeah. we've known for a long time, right? Not just, not just for tourists to come, but for our own children yeah. to know our history and know what's happening in Clinton County and the Tri-County area and the whole North Country. Some it's of important. these historic things, I'll let you hold this photograph. Some of these historic things have been well-kept secrets. Uh, I've mentioned before on this very program, we just had a recent bass tournament here and they, some of the biggest smallmouth bass fishermen in the country have proclaimed Lake Champlain the best small mouth bass fishery in the United States. But he said it's been a secret for far too long. And I, as I've said many times before, it's time to let the secret out. What do you think? I think that's true. I mean, it's an outdoor sportsman's dream. And so many other things we have, like a little bit of sunshine on a day when we thought it was gonna <laughs> rain. We must have wished it away, because it seems it to be leaving. This, uh, Every time I stand where we're standing right now, I have a special feeling, and I think incorporated in that feeling are all the other times I've, I've stood here when flags were going up and down, and com base commanders were changing, and people were marching, and I can picture what it, likes, what it looked like uh, 75, 80, 90, 100 years ago here, and it's a lot of great history. It sure is something we should preserve and have a good record of so people can see it and know what it, know what it was. And we cried and complained when the base closed, but look at this. I think we're underway. The thing about Plattsburgh, we always make the best of anything. So now we have to, you have to plan now to do an interview after the next 50 years. All right. Maybe we can still find the old Dodge, huh? Let's do five at a time. Okay, five at a time. I like that. I read last night to my wife something out of a magazine where an older couple got married. He was in his late, she was in her late 60s and he was in his late 70s and they celebrate their anniversary every three months so they can get to 25. <laughs> Helen and John, thanks so much for talking with us. Thanks so much for everything both of you have done for this North Country. Well, thank you. And thank you for what you've been doing and still are doing, Gordy. We enjoy That's what every, keeps us together. every minute of it and you know it. Just take a look around this place. If you like antique cars, if you like to see your friends and neighbors enjoying a, a little bit of fun, just take a look around. You know, it's amazing, Ron Venn. Everywhere I go, people say, who's that Venn guy? Who's that Venn guy that does the pictures? Who's that Venn guy that does the models? Who's that Venn guy? Because Ron and I and Calvin have done, what, nine? Nine two-hour shows together. And that's not to mention the hundreds of times we've mentioned your name and seen you at special functions, like the one at the, at the American Legion Post 20 a few weeks ago. That was nice. Yeah, that was nice. They got, were you surprised when they decided to come over and get a whole bunch of your dioramas? Yeah, well, then they called me about, I think it was like last year. So then should I know, you know, if I, if I had, because see, I guess you found out from you that I had diarrhea. Yes, you know, I don't keep very many secrets. So, uh, so I know if I could bring some. So I said, well, how many do you want? Well, she said 25. So it took me a couple of days to clean them all because they're a little bit dusty. So then they came about five after 10 with a pickup truck. And then uh, I got home about quarter to nine, but took two cars because some, uh, one brought one in his car, the other two brought, the other two in the, uh, Christine Rotella's car. So, uh, you got him home, but you actually have made what a hundred or so? Yeah, about a hundred. About a hundred. Yeah. Now they're down at the Council of the Arts. I know you have fa how many down there? Well, Sylvia took thirteen, including the house of the dusty attic. There, <laughs> uh, the, the one that I've mentioned so many times, where I said to to Ron, "How did you get that attic to look so perfect?" He said, "Out of my mother's vacuum cleaner bag." Well, that, well, that one's down there. <laughs> I know, I had to walk behind it to see if it still looked the same. But just not, not to mention these, these uh, World War II and, and other diorama scenes that he's made. 
He's made uh, vehicles, lots of vehicles, not just the Lozier, but how many vehicles do you think you've done? Like model cars? Model cars, vehicles of all kinds. Oh, about trucks, power about trucks. About three, four hundred, I guess. Snow plows, snow plows. About three or four hundred, I guess. Uh, telephone trucks. Uh, cars, stock cars, custom cars, you know, like out of model kits. I just put them together for Owen there. They sent me in uh, January. It's a 1909 Lozier Briarcliff. So I, yeah, I brought that this morning, so I give that to him. Oh, you did? You made one? No, no, he had me build a model kit. He sent me two model kits from Florida. So he wanted me to put this one and paint it in blue, so I already gave it to him when I seen him this morning. So he's got that somewhere, and we haven't seen it. You're, these uh, are, are these two fairly new. Well, this is the newest one this here. This is the newest one. Yeah. That's the one you built before, right? Yeah, well, that was here last year. This is one I just finished uh, June twentieth of this year. I started uh, February and I finished in June. So well, this is uh, this is the racing model, and this is looks exactly like the photograph of the Lozier that raced in the Indy five hundred, right? Yeah, I try to get as close as I can with photographs that I had. This Owen was, is the one who wanted me to build it, because he wants one. I got his partly apart, because he's supposed to let me know what number he wants on the grill and for the side, and then I can finish the car off. This is Dr. Vaccaro's here. Oh, it is? Yeah, mine's home. Oh, you got yours at home? Same thing. You know, I, I have can't remember how many years ago, but it's four or five years ago when I first met you down at the farmer's market, remember? Yeah, it was in 98. Was it? 98, four years ago. And I think you had this trolley car there at that time yeah no. well, nancy Dunahoe got me into this here <laughs> oh she did really yeah she wanted me to From bring the cornerstone bookstore yeah she wanted me to bring some of my trolleys and trains and i guess she sent you down where i was and that's how it started so. and we got down there and i said wow look at this kind of stuff that's beautiful yeah, plattsburgh the traction company and we saw a book about the plattsburgh traction company and this now can be part of uh, this yeah. great transportation museum yeah the other one's down the Council of the Arts. Sure. Uh, Sylvia's got that one too. So. Yeah, there's a month-long exhibition going down there, and Calvin doesn't know know it yet, but I think a week from Monday we're going down there to talk to some of those people where the great photographs are down there yeah. as we're recording this late in uh, in June of 2002. Yeah. You're on the committee for this new transportation museum, aren't you? Yeah, I am. The official photographer? Well, that's what he calls me. So. Well, <laughs> then he, you, you love to take pictures, don't you? Yeah. I just took some yesterday. You know. Did you? Yeah. In the rain. In the <laughs> People still talk about all the photographs Ron has taken, the before and after pictures. Are you still doing any of those? That's what I was doing yesterday in the Where rain. You were before yeah, and I afters? yeah, I took about nine more. Yeah, I took some up in uh, Saranac when my sister comes up from Connecticut. And I, I take her out for rides, you know, <laughs> like she actually go riding around. So I got some in Saranac at the Anson store there, what used to be a dirt road. And then when they, when they had that, that spring flood, I think it was in July, where I took the bridge out and kill, it killed like three supervisors. So I guess I went and photographed that area. We talked about that several days ago. We were talking about the floods on the Saranac River and there's some, been some bad ones. Ron, I want to thank you so much for being a good friend. Okay. But more than that, I want to thank you for all you, all the stuff you've done. You're an amazing and wonderful person. Yeah. One of these days we're going to have to do chapter 10, right? Yeah. We'll do it. A man of many talents. Uh, I want to thank all of our viewers for being with us today in this edition of Our Little Corner. It's on the former Plattsburgh Air Force Base Oval. It's an annual Adirondack area antique car show. But there's a flea market and craft show here at the same time, and it's really nice to see friends and neighbors getting together like the old days for something that uh, creates a common interest. In this case, we're focusing on the f past transportation and the future museum to honor transportation in the North Country. Thanks to all the folks we've interviewed today and all the folks we've just taken pictures of on the way by. We hope we got your best side. <laughs> and who knows? where we're going to be next time for our little corner. <laughs>